As we consider God's Word together this morning, let's turn together in Acts 9. We'll look together at verses 26 through 31. Acts 9, verse 26 through 31. Continuing our, our uh, biography, in a sense, of the Holy Spirit's work in His church, uh, concentrating especially on the Apostle Paul, and he is the subject of of much of what's uh, written in, in chapter 9. Acts 9, beginning in verse 26, where we continue to follow Paul around. And it says, And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at, the, at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. So far, the reading from God's Word this morning, may He add its blessing to our hearts. There is a mistaken notion, I think we, practice, we all practice it to some degree or another, that as long as you get what you want, you will be happy. You will be at peace. The way to a better you is through self-fulfillment, is through achieving your dreams. But that's not the gospel. The gospel instead says that you will have peace when you realize that you did not get what you wanted. Because you know what we are like by nature, right? We are rebellious by nature. We flee from the presence of God and, and in our rebellion we are crying out for one thing only. And that is for God's wrath. We desire to be separated from God by nature. And the gospel is saying, no, you will have peace when you are changed, when you will not get what you at first wanted. And then as the Christian grows in his understanding of the awe of Christ who purchased him from redemption, this peace increases. This peace grows and this peace is established. And we see something of that peace in our chapter, in our section of Scripture today. This section of Scripture shows us that the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit bring peace to the Christian. And the church uh, is grown by the Holy Spirit as He works those things in them. And uh, to learn that, we're going to first look at the difficulty the church has in accepting Saul of Tarsus. And then second, we're going to consider what it means to fear God. So the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit bring peace to the Christian as an, as an individual and to the church as a whole as the Holy Spirit grows them. We're going to see first how the church has trouble accepting Saul in verses 26 through 30. We're going to look at the fear of God in verse 31. So let's begin first by considering the church and the difficulty she has in accepting Saul. Uh, sometimes when we read familiar biblical accounts, we miss the drama. We miss the turmoil, the, the degree of change that is recorded in a matter of verses. It hasn't been too long that we've read about Saul's conversion dramatically on the road of Damascus. And, and here we have a, another part of his life where Saul is seen as a change agent. In the first place, when we first meet Saul, he is a change agent. He brings change into people's lives. Not the kind of change that they want, but he brings change into their lives. The Christians are in turmoil because of the, the, the persecution that Saul is, is orchestrating. He is, he is chasing down believers and he's tearing families apart. And so the arm of his flesh brings about this, this turmoil, this, this rage that that. that, that has implications for everybody that he comes into contact with who is a believer. But now as a convert, he's still a change agent. But it's a completely different kind of change that Saul works. Now he is the object of wrath. 
Because when he declares the gospel, he is declaring the work of God. He is declaring the work of the Spirit. And because of his preaching, he becomes a wanted man. Uh, we see that uh, as a result of his preaching in ministry, in ministry in Damascus, that both the synagogue and the rulers of that city had become enraged at him, had become so enraged at him that they wanted him dead. They were disturbed by what he said and thought, well, the best way to solve this problem is to get rid of the man. And that's recorded in chapter 9 for us in a matter of verses. Now, that may seem like a completely normal day for Saul of Tarsus for you, but that is radical stuff in his life. His life is turned upside down. Can you imagine? He's converted on the road to Damascus from a hater of Christ to a lover of Christ, from a persecutor of the church to a preacher in the church. And as he begins to preach the gospel in the synagogues, the people that he loved, who he considered his friends before, turn on him, turn on him in mass to the extent that they wait outside of his house and at the gates of the city so that they can kill him. That's what you experience when you step out the door to go to work, right? This tumult, this, this chaos that is part of, of, of Saul's life. And, and it's to such an extent that he has to be lowered in a basket through a window in the wall of Damascus to be delivered from his oppressors. Now, have you thought about what happened after Saul hit the ground outside the wall of Damascus? Now what? What does he do now? He's, okay, he's, he's outside of Damascus, but where does he go now? All the people that he knew were in Jerusalem. The high priest, the, the synagogue rulers in Jerusalem. What do you think would happen to him there if he went to speak to them? What do you think would happen to Saul of Tarsus if he shows up at Caiaphas' house and says, well, uh, I have bad news for you, Caiaphas. I've, I've changed my ma mind about uh, this Christ. And in fact, I think he is the Son of God. He is Almighty God come in the flesh to deliver us from the guilt of our sins. What happened when Jesus declared himself to be the Son of God in, in Caiaphas' presence? What happened to Stephen when he declared himself to be seeing the Son of God standing next to the Father in glory? Well, they had a, a fairly short end after that, didn't they? Well, only a few more verses were needed to describe what happened to Stephen when he declared Jesus as the Christ. And so Saul, he hits the, he hits the floor uh, outside the wall of Damascus and he has nowhere else to go. So he, he journeys 150 miles south to Jerusalem on foot and he tries to join the church. These are now his brothers. These are now his fellow believers. They have faith in Christ in common and and he wants to be joined to them. But they don't want to welcome him. They don't want to welcome this man because they're skeptical about his profession of faith. We don't really have an equivalent in our day. You understand, we don't have a way to compare what the people in Jerusalem were facing and what they endured when Saul of Tarsus walked in the doors of their gathering place because we're not persecuted here. We don't have those kinds of pressures. But uh, to help us try to think about what it might be like, imagine a, a Christian church, maybe it's in Syria or maybe it's in Iraq, where ISIS is in control. They are the ones who are ruling and reigning. And a video has just been released where they have lined up another bunch of Christians and, and have cut their heads off. And the one who was on the video, the one who spoke for for the prophet Muhammad, ostensibly, in, in that video. He's been converted. He's been converted. He's now a Christian. And the next Sunday, he comes up to First Presbyterian of wherever in, in Syria, and he walks in the door. What do you think the people in that church will think? There's going to be a mixture of feelings. Maybe some terror. Maybe some fear. Maybe some skepticism. Well, that's what the Jerusalem church is facing. There's, there's cause for them to be suspicious because they don't know what Saul of Tarsus is going to do. Even though some time has passed from, uh, from the moment when he was converted, still the people of Jerusalem have their doubts. In verse 19, 
uh, sorry, not verse 19, but uh, in, 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 uh, verse, in the second part of verse 19, yes, it says, for some days he was with the disciples in Damascus. And in verse 23, it says, when many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. Some time has passed for the people of Jerusalem, but they don't know about Saul of Tarsus. They don't have access to the internet. They can't see his new sermons posted at Damascus Church, right? They don't know what he's doing. They have no idea. And so they live in, in fear. They, they live not trusting him and not wanting to welcome him into their assembly. But there is one godly man in the church who vouches for Saul. That is Barnabas. We've met Barnabas before. Back in Acts 4, we met Barnabas. Barnabas was the one, a Jew, a Levite from Cyprus, who sold his field and laid the proceeds of that field at the feet of the apostles. He was the one who, and, uh, who, who, uh, uh, who, um, uh, who are the people who died in the, in the selling their money, or pretending that they gave all their money. Uh, Ananias, thank you very much. Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, uh, they, they were following after Barnabas. His name means son of encouragement. And the same thing is true here. He, he acts according to his name. He is a son of encouragement, not only for the people of Jerusalem, but for Saul of Tarsus as well. He encourages the church by helping her see what has taken place in, in Saul's life. He vouches for his story of conversion. He affirms the changes in Saul, that he has become a preacher of the gospel in Damascus. And it takes this assurance from Barnabas to awaken the church, to awaken the church to receive Saul. Now, can you imagine the worship service right after Saul is converted, how strange that would have been? I don't know how much time has passed, maybe three years has passed since Saul went begun his persecution against the Jewish church. And it could be that he was sitting in the same room worshiping his Savior with a family still torn apart because the husband is still in prison or because the child had been ripped from them for their faith in Christ Jesus. Persecutor turned preacher become brother together in the worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. It must have been humbling for Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus never forgot what he was to the church before his conversion. In four of his letters, he mentions that he was a persecutor of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. In four of his letters, he says how unworthy he is to be called Christian, paraphrasing him, because of his work as a persecutor of the church. But this persecutor is converted, and now he does worship Christ. He does sit with the remnants of the families that he participated in destroying. And it's a picture of divine grace worked in the church of Christ. It's a divine grace that works in the church, the spirit of forgiveness to the one who persecuted them. I don't know if you know the story of Corrie ten Boom. Corrie ten Boom was a, a Dutch woman, and she and her sister and her father uh, were uh, involved in hiding Jews during the Second World War from uh, Nazi uh, German, the German occupying forces there. And she was arrested for her troubles on February 28, 1944, even as the war came to an end. And as, the, as part of her arrest, she was sentenced to a concentration camp, a Ravensbrück concentration camp, where she went for the remainder of the war, she and her sister. Her sister Betsy died there at the hands of cruel oppressors, in this prison camp where she was withheld the medicine that she needed and the food that she needed. She died under the cruelty of the guards and Corrie ten Boom watched it happen. Well, uh, perhaps you're familiar with the ministry that God gave to her, a ministry of, of declaring uh, reconciliation between God and man. And she, as part of her Ministry goes around and gives talks or gave talks about what it means to forgive. And as she was giving one of those talks in 1947, three years after she was arrested, less than three years after she saw her sister die at the hands of cruel oppressors, less than three years later, in Munich, she's giving a talk. And who is in the audience but one of the cruelest prison guards 
of the camp. And her talk ended. She was distracted because she recognized him. She didn't think he recognized her. And at the end of the talk, this prison guard came up to her. And he said, I have been converted. I have become a follower of Christ. I know that God has forgiven me. But will you forgive me, dear sister? And as he held out her hand, and as he pled for her forgiveness, she describes it as seeming to last for hours, this discussion that she was having in her head. How can I forgive this man who was so cruel, who caused, in part at least, the death of my own sister? How can I forgive this man? But in the final analysis, she reached out her hand and she forgave him. How did she forgive him? Why did she forgive him? She forgave him because of Scripture's testimony. God's Word teaches us who we are. To know who you are is a great motivation when it comes to dealing in a gentle and forgiving way with the people you see around you. Uh, with your children, sometimes if you have children or maybe you have to think of other people's children because your children don't do this or, or your neighbor's children or something like that, you see your children and you say to yourself, I can't believe they have done this again. I can't, I just told them yesterday and, and now they're doing it. I told them not to touch that and now look, they've knocked it over and it's broken, it's a mess all over the place. I can't believe they've done that. How do you think God looks at you? How many times do you think God sees the commands that He has given to you? And you've knocked it over again, and you've made a mess of it all, and it's, it's terrible. How does God look at you? Does he, does he deal gently with you? Or does He deal harshly with you? He deals gently with you. And so it informs how we are to be with each other. You can think of uh, different scripture verses that teach us the importance of forgiveness one to another. The passage that came to Corey ten Boom, ten Boom's mind while she was arguing with herself, uh, with this, watching this guard with his hands stretched out, the passage that she thought of was Matthew 6, verse 15, where Jesus says, If you don't forgive others, God will not forgive you. You can think of uh, another example, perhaps in, in Matthew 18, verse 21 and following, the parable of the unmerciful servant who, who owes his master a debt that he could never repay. And, he, and his master threatens to, to cast him into prison. He pleads with his master, and his master is gracious to him. And then he finds a fellow servant who owes him only a little bit, and he begins to choke him. Pay me what you owe me. And the master has a change of heart, doesn't he? Because the servant is unforgiving, so the master is unforgiving. The result is he's handed over to the jailers. That is what will happen if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. That's what happened in the Jerusalem church. For them to be able to welcome Saul of Tarsus, a light bulb had to go on. He also is a child of God. He is no different than I am. He is no different. He is in need of redemption as I am in need of redemption. Without Christ, he is going to hell as I would be going to hell without Christ. As the Christian knows himself, he stops pointing. He stops pointing at other people and, and their sin. And he start, starts living with more patience, more mercy for other sinners. And you see that established in the Jerusalem church. Saul is accepted, and he begins preaching in Jerusalem. His preaching has uh, the same effect. So his preaching ministry in Jerusalem at that time is, is short-lived. His opponents, the Hellenists, want to kill him, and, and Saul escapes with the aid of the church. That's something, isn't it? His brothers have embraced him to such an extent that they want to spare his, not, his life now. He is sent away to Caesarea and on to Tarsus by the church of Christ. The grace that Christ applied to his people is now applied by his people to Saul of Tarsus. That's Christian mercy because it flows from Christ's mercy 
to them. And so Saul is accepted in the church of Jerusalem after sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit among his people. But then it says something very telling in, in verse 31, that the church walked in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The church enjoying a season of rest and peace and strengthening now is walking in the fear of the Lord. It says at the beginning of, of verse 31 that the church in all these different places has peace. Why does it have peace? Why does the church have peace? It's a, it's a curious reason. It has peace because Saul of Tarsus is sent away. Saul of Tarsus is removed from the situation and the peace, and God gives to his church a season of peace. The church is now seen to have substantially completed phase two of the book of Acts. Phase one is the church in Jerusalem. How is the church described in, in verse 31? It's described as, as the church in, in Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. The church is no longer restricted to one place. It's spread abroad throughout, uh, throughout Palestine. And so the church is, is, is accomplishing its, its growth through the work of the Holy Spirit. And so as the church is enjoying this peace, it does so in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The church's peace isn't found in in getting what she wants. The church isn't saying, well, that was, a, that was a time of heavy lifting. I'm glad that's over. I'm going to take the next three years off because that was rough. I don't want to, I need some time to recoup. That's not what the church does. The church walks in the fear of the Lord. The thing that motivates them during oppression is the same thing that motivates them during ease, the fear of the Lord. Now, we can understand the fear of the Lord in in two ways. We can understand the fear of the Lord as the fear that the unbeliever experiences as he anticipates the judgment of God. And you can see that in a place like 2, Corinthians, or, no, 2 Chronicles 14, verse 14. You have a king of Judah uh, wiping out uh, the, the Philistine cities and, and the people of those cities live in the fear of the Lord. They walk knowing that the judgment is of God is hovering over them, and they're in terror. They are in terror because God is about to judge them. We would call that servile fear, the fear of a servant before his master. But there's also a fear of the Lord for, for God's people. For example, in Joshua 24, verse 14, he speaks to the people of the Lord uh, of the fear that results in sincere and faithful service. That is respect. That is awe. We would describe that as, as filial fear, like the fear between a child and a parent. An awe, a respect, this kind of filial fear. That's what we're talking about in the church of Acts. This filial fear is upon the church, and it's learned by God's people as they grow in their understanding of Him, as they see His work, as they know their own sin. The fear of the Lord is something that should be and can be cultivated in us. You see it in, in, uh, in David's, one of David's prayers in Psalm 34. In verse 11 it says, Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. David wants to teach to his children the fear of the Lord, to stand in awe of God, to recognize His greatness, to see His might and His power, and to see how helpless you are before Him, to recognize His protection over you, His gifts to you. The fear of the Lord in the book of Proverbs is described as, as wisdom. Wisdom is the fear of the Lord. In Proverbs 8, it describes the fear of the Lord as hatred of evil. And so the fear of the Lord is, is learned and it's expressed in worship. It's expressed in reverence and awe in the presence of the Lord. The fear of the Lord, it's a, a fountain of life where we learn to turn away from death. That's what Proverbs 14 says. And in the church, they are walking in this fear. They have the wisdom from the Holy Spirit. They're turning away from evil. Uh, they're finding life in the Word of God. They're living in awe of Him according 
to his law. They are loving God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. They worship according to his command. They worship only him. They respect his name. They honor the Sabbath with worship. And as they live this way, in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it says that the church multiplies. When God's people fear him, when the comfort of the Holy Spirit is upon him, they embrace the members of the body, recognizing their brothers and sisters as something of themselves. And in, in that way, the church is built up. The church is strengthened. The church is multiplied. It is the work of God in impressing his people with the gospel of salvation. So God shows the church and, uh, and Saul to be the same kind of person, right? Saul, the only difference between Saul pre, uh, pre-Jerusalem pre church member and post-Jerusalem church member is the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's the only thing that's changed in his life. And the same is true with everybody else who was part of the body of Christ. They have all been guilty before him, but he has loved them. With, with a perfectly sacrificial love. In his compassion, he has sent his son. He has sent Jesus Christ. He lives perfectly, obediently. He suffers all God's, God's wrath for his people's sin. And he does that for all his people. Their sins uh, against him are, are, are far greater than their sins against each other. And yet he invites us. And yet he adopts us. And yet he makes us his own. So when we think of the mercy of Christ and the mercy of, this, in the, of the Jerusalem church, we learn first of all that our knowledge of self should lead to patience and compassion with your fellow Christian. The Jerusalem church was wrong not to welcome Saul. It was a, an act of lack of faith, and yet at the same time I understand why they didn't. I know that kind of doubt in my own heart. But even in far lesser offenses... Forget about somebody who was a persecutor of the church. But even in far lesser offenses, our tendency is to see the sins of others clearly and react passionately against them while turning a blind eye towards our own sin. But it helps us to focus on our own sin rather than on the sins of others. When we come face to face with our own sin, we'll have far less energy to worry about the sins of others. We will we'll be too busy with a log in our own eye to be concerned about the speck in the eye of our brother. And when we do have time to notice the speck, our tone will be different. Our tone will be something like, come over here, brother. You and I are the same kind of person. We are the same kind of fallen creature. We are sinful. We are in need of Christ. Let me tell you of his mercy to me. Remind me of his mercy to me again because I have failed, I've sinned, I've fallen short of his glory. Let me help you up and please help me up. This is the heart of a person who understands who he is in the sight of Christ. Forgiven, not deserving. And so when you know who you are in the sight of God, when you acknowledge your 100% need of Christ, it it humbles you. It corrects your prideful attitude towards others. And instead, there should be left only a desire to fulfill Galatians 6, verse 1. To bear each other's burdens. To fulfill the law of Christ in that way. To fulfill burdens wherever they came from. To fulfill each other's burdens. So your knowledge of self should lead to patience and compassion for your fellow Christian. And it also teaches us that the church's task is to live in the fear of the Lord. It's easy. It's easy for the Christian to replace the fear of the Lord with the fear of man. And one of the examples that I want us to focus on as a congregation this morning is in how the church handles her worship. The temptation of the church the temptation of men in the church is to want to be bigger, to have more numbers, to have more people in the pew. Now, that's not necessarily a wrong desire. I'm not saying that that's a sinful desire, so long as it's not a controlling desire. A good desire can become a controlling desire which leads to destruction. 
To want more people to glorify God is a, a good thing. To want more people to glorify God and to sacrifice the truth for that is destructive. There is a, a common refrain in the church probably throughout the ages. We have to make the people coming in feel comfortable. So we have to look a little bit more like what they are used to seeing. Now, I'm with you as far as saying the people who come to this congregation should feel welcome. They should feel comfortable. They should know that the people who greet them care about them and want their best. But if you mean adjust what we do to suit tastes, I think that's a, an error. The worship of Cliffwood is aimed at expressing a proper, healthy fear of the Lord. Now, I'm not saying this is the only way that that can be done. But what I am saying is that the session, to the best of their ability, is seeking to fear the Lord and how it structures the worship service here. We worship God in the splendor of holiness. We don't come here to please men. The way the church is strengthened and multiplied is for the church to continue its march not towards the American dream, right? Not towards happiness for all people, but that the worship of God and the splendor of holiness would be preserved. That the people would fear the Lord, that we would keep our eyes fixed on Him, that we would seek to serve Him. That would be true whether it be in the front lines in the engagement of the culture, whether it be in the worship services of Cliffwood Presbyterian Church, whether it be in the privacy of your own home, whether it be in any other congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our focus is to walk in the fear of the Lord. He is the only one deserving of your worship. And so don't give it to another. Don't give it to men. Don't give it to ideas. Don't give it to programs. Don't give it to methods. Give it to God Almighty because He died for you and He shed His blood for you. Nobody else did. He is great and merciful and kind. So serve Him. As the church welcomes her former persecutor, there's a unity that's beyond understanding. A pagan who looks at that says, how can this be? The persecutor and the persecuted now joined in holding hands in the worship of God, singing praises together, praying together, breaking bread together. It's a unity that flows from the fear of the Lord, that comes from, from the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's a unity that flows from a recognition of who we are and, how, and who we are in relation to the people who are sitting all around you right now. All of us are in the same boat. We are in the same place, needing redemption in Christ Jesus. This is the message of the gospel which brings peace to the Christian, which brings peace to to the church. This is the message that Saul of Tarsus de declared. This is the message that Peter declared. This is the message that the Jerusalem church declared. This is the message of the gospel by which the Holy Spirit calls all men to himself, whether it be here or whether it be in his church in some other place. The people of God are joined in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit because he has died for them. Let's pray together.